Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is my great pleasure to be here in Antofagosta today, this afternoon. And I have been, uh, have seen quite a lot of children coming, so they are the new generation that will enjoy the research and development on robots, so that's so nice. They spend their afternoon to see what will be their future. So I am uh, showing where I am working. You see the globe here, and what you can see, I am working in two places, so I commute a lot. So one of the place is at the left side, you can see is Geneva. Geneva is in Switzerland. As you can see, that's a very conservative city. That means that is even not allow, allowed to build high scrapers. You see, this is forever. If you come in 200 years, let's say, our next people to come, you will see the same view. So I'm working in Mira Lab on virtual reality, virtual worlds, and also social robots. Now, if you look at the other image, which is 10,000 kilometers away, this is Singapore. So Singapore is, of course, the modern, most ultra-modern city. As you can see here, a very famous building of $8 billion. This is the most expensive building in the world, just to give an impression of my two places where I am working. So this is the two places, and I navigate very often between each other. Okay, so what I would like to speak today is different things. First of all, what I would like to explain to you is the idea of robots. We have the impression that robots are very new for us. But in the reality, it is an idea that dates out from the antiquity. So if you see here a very famous T-shirt, I modified it with Nadine social robots that add to the picture. You can see that we evaluate towards our next companions to come. And if you look further, it's just what I like to tell you. I will spend some time in my first part of my presentation to explain what the ancestors, you know, in all Greek, but also in Egypt and in Middle East, in many parts of the world, even before Christus, people were dreaming of robots. So here in ancient Greek mythology, what you can see is Talos. So Talos is one of those. They have many of them. Talos was a giant, and this giant had, was made out of bronze. And when the enemies were coming on the island of Crete, the enemies, due to the heat of his body, then they became burnt. And then with, he is uh, waiting 10 tons, and he's also 10 meters uh, high. So you see it's a giant that was protecting the island of Crete. And even it is said that he has some kind of blood given by the god, and then he was able to, of course, move and do all kinds of actions. So it's just to tell you that in the mythology, in Greece, in the Middle East, in Asian cultures, many people were dreaming of having robots. So the concepts was already defined. Now, if you continue, everybody, I guess, do you know Leonardo da Vinci? Yes? Yes, I think everybody has heard. And of course, he was a very great man because he was a philosopher and an engineer. He has done quite a lot of things coming from Italy. And you know what is great? We have found a lot of drawings, so you can see them behind, a lot of drawings, and he has been able to do a lot of robots. So what are these robots? They were mechanical entities already. In the 15th century, he was able to define some mechanics. And for example here, what you see at the right side of the screen is a knight 
that was bowing in front of very VIP people at that time, uh, all kind of important people. So what is the idea to model an automaton that is able to do instead, instead of a real person? So you see what you have to understand, the motivation, the human motivation is extremely strong to have similar people doing actions as we are doing. Now, if you look at the other one, it's more recent in the time. In Switzerland, for example, in Germany or in France and in other countries, people in the 19th century were passionate about mechanics. And what did they do? They did automaton. So if you come to Switzerland, for example, you have quite a few museums where you can see automaton. They can do music, they can do uh, all kind of actions. So this one I show here, you see it's a kind of robot. The making of it is also with motors and cable, like the robots today, but the difference is that is no software, is only, they can only do one task. For example, this one is only able to write, but at least she is on the definition of a writer and nothing else. But these ones are really the ancestors of our robot of today. Now what I would like to speak is about, you know, I have explained to you the body, what we can duplicate in terms of human and the dream of our ancestors until today in a very short time. But what I would like also to explain to you is the dream to model the brain. You know, humans are different than animals because always we have thought we can think. But can we model the thinking? And this was all kind, I summarized the history, but we have major people like Leibniz, you know, who was born in Germany. And in this time, at the 17th century, he was doing mathematics like differential equation, integration, and so on. So this is what we use heavily today when you study at secondary or high school level. And he was thinking at the same time, because he used to be also a philosopher, he said that human reasoning could be reduced to mechanical calculation. So you can imagine in the 18th century to say that the thought can be uh, done through mechanical calculation should have been something incredibly new and shaky in terms of thinking that the human thinking is impossible to model. Now if you look, another one, I took a French one, Diderot, maybe you have heard or not, at least in the French part of the culture, people know Diderot, and Diderot, you know, in the time of the 18th century, what people were thinking is, what is the difference between an animal and a human? So Diderot tried to say that if we find a parrot who could answer to everything, I would claim it to be an intelligent being without hesitation. So what is interesting is this declaration has led to further research in the 20th and 20th century with apes that are able to be imitate or to do some brain or attitude uh, function like humans. So this was very important that philosophers in the 18th century start to say that we can even in animals develop some thinking and we can make tests about it. Okay, now what I try to tell you is something else. Is, you know, a computer is only mathematics behind. So even if you see Nadine, you will see in a few moments, behind she is a computer with a lot of mathematics. 
So in fact, where comes this mathematics? Of course, we have Leibniz, people like that, and all kinds of mathematicians. But what we have more is, for example, Boole. You have surely heard of George Boole. George Boole was a mathematician in the 19th century. He lived almost unknown. That means that in his time, he was almost not recognized and unknown. And he is somebody who has allowed the programming. That means when you write programs, you write mathematical concepts, but as a computer is working with value like zero and one, what Boole did, and you see it in the Boole algebra, you can see that if you have some mathematical concept, you can translate it in operations with zero and one uniquely. So the only mathematics used as a basic uh, values is zero and one. And when you know that one century later, or uh, more than that, one century and a half later, the computers work with zero and one in their programming at the basic level, we can imagine that this discovery is essential over the time. So this is what George Boole has done. You know, a bit later, in 1940, around like that, you know, so it's a bit more than one century ago, what was also very important in other disciplines is that we discover the cells of the brain. And not only that, what did we discover, which is incredibly important? We discover that the cells in the brain are linked together uh, and it's like an electrical network. That means that when you have cells in the brain, they cell send electrical uh, electricity. You see, you have the big yellow cells and they are like cabled with nerves and between one to the other is like electrical uh, circuit. So in fact, the big discovery was to say we have in the brain a network of electricity uh, entities and what is also interesting, it works either the current electricity current passes or it doesn't pass. It's, so to, to model this, we also need to have Boole uh, mathematics because it's also zero or one value if we translate this into a model. So all these discoveries were very important. Okay, I skip now a bit further. And what was very important in the history of computers is uh, when computers arrive. Computers could be done only because you have these mathematicians and this knowledge that has de been defined before. So if you look at the image of the old computers, uh, you know that these old computers, like you have now a phone, and let's say 70 years ago, you needed to have a full room like this one full of computers who were hardly able to do what your phone is doing. So in fact, this old computer was the first one we had. And there was somebody very well known in computer science, is Turing, and Turing tries to model intelligence. So you know today, we speak a lot of artificial intelligence. I think Everybody has heard about it. But when did it start? So this is exactly the time where it started. Because we have all this knowledge over the centuries, then in the 50s, there was Turing who said the following. Put a machine and a human in a room and send in written questions. If we cannot tell which answers are from the machine or the human, the machine is thinking. So in fact, what we have to think is you are in a room, you type something, the computer answers you, and if you cannot distinguish that it is a machine, then Turing said at this time, 
we can declare that uh, the machine is thinking. So this, he pretends this, but it took a couple of years, particularly in the MIT, they were very strong in intelligence uh, uh, AI at that time. And in MIT, somebody very known in uh, artificial intelligence, Joseph Weizenbaum, uh, in the 60s, 76, uh, wrote a program to make a test for uh, seeing if, when we speak of Turing test, if it's true. So the validation was done with this program. That means that in the 70s or 80s, students, and this is an example here, were able to speak to computer and say, okay, uh, like here, I'm afraid, I have problems, I am, I'm afraid to miss my exam. And ELISA, the program, was able to answer in a proper way. So everybody said at that time, late 70s, okay, now we know we have simulated intelligence and this is done. So the years passed and then we discover that reasoning is not only a question of intelligence. That means the intelligence or the reasoning is only one part of the intelligence. Today we know that we have other components. We have emotional intelligence, we have social intelligence, we have instinct, whatever, which makes that we can be very successful if we have this kind of attributes. So, if you look at this picture on the bottom of the slide, you see very usual meeting. So in a meeting, it's not only to reason, what you need is to recognize who does what, how this person behave, how they interact, and of course the Turing test is not sufficient uh, to say that we have model intelligence. The intelligence is much more than that. Now, I just would like to analyze what has changed between the computers 60 years ago when they were created and today. So, of course, everybody knows with this image that 60 years ago, uh, the computers took so much place, took have little memory, we could not so much interact with them, and uh, the computer uh, itself was very limited. Now, 60 years later, what has changed is mainly that the computer is faster, the memory is immense, and also we have incredible possibilities to interact. Here you see a young lady with a hat, 3D glasses, and she is able to see the virtual worlds. So you see, we communicate with the computer and we can even represent uh, visually what the computer calculates. So this is the novelty in 60 years. And maybe what you hear every day today, what is new is that the software, you have very big layer of programs or software, and this software allows to capture a lot of data. For example, yourself, when you make photos or videos, you capture a lot of data, and then it goes to the memory, and then eventually the computer can analyze and give back some results. So you see, we are reaching the big data. That means that we have billions of data. It will just grow, and out of this billion of data, there are some program analyzing and classifying them in a way that they are becoming meaningful data. So we can have uh, analyzed events, and events due to some models we can analyze, we can predict, predict the future. So that's something very important, and you have surely heard about deep learning algorithms or learning programs. In fact, uh, for example, if a robot or a computer would like to recognize this glass, how does it do? It has 
a huge database of different shape of glasses, maybe millions, and when the computer detects the shape of this glass, it will compare with the millions of data, each one, and when it sees one that is more or less similar, annotated, it's written is the glass in the database, then it will uh, know that, okay, it's a glass, and I can do something with it. So this is how, let's say, computers today are using big data and producing intelligence. So you see they reason in a different way as us. We are not needed to have millions of data to recognize it is a glass. But as the computer is very fast, then at the end of the day, the computer will be stronger or, in parenthesis, cleverer as we are because it goes faster. We are totally unable in our memory to store all this data and to analyze them. Okay, now I would like to speak of something else because we will come to concrete robots. And you know, many, very often people say, why are you producing robots? Because in fact, in many countries, people are unemployed, uh, we are all looking for jobs, and we wonder why we need more robots. What I have described to you is this human uh, willingness since antiquity to have people doing things, and these people should look like ourselves. So this is something that is very deep in ourselves. But also what I would like to show you, a reality of life. If you look at these images for many centuries, and you know it has started since the antiquity. Since the antiquity, many, many people, including children, have been used as slaves. And why? Because people like to have cheap labor, do difficult jobs, and for that, they alienate a lot of people and they take them as slaves. So you see, of course, America is an example uh, more recently where all black people were brought to America. And so you can see children are being used today. And what is very important is the numbers. You can see here the numbers that, in fact, today, today I speak in 2017, we have tens of millions of people in slavery today. So what does it mean? The researchers estimate 21 million are enslaved. And what do they do? If you look at this, 78 are in horrible labor status, 22% are prostitutes, and the other one, 26, are children under the age of 18. So, this should not happen in our society. And you see also that, in fact, the slavery generates 150 billion US dollars for traffickers every year. So when we know that, first of all, we know that we have to respect every individual, and this should stop. So that we have robots doing this all kind of job, it is fine, but that we use humans to abuse them, to do that, and to make a lot of money, I think we have to change this in society. So if you look, to continue, for the use of robots, if you look at this, you see quite a lot of ladies who work in a chain and cut meat. So we can imagine the smell and the job, maybe 10 hours a day, to cut this meat in the chain. And you can see also the dangerous activity when you build houses or you have to go to mines and this kind of job which are very unhealthy and dangerous. So today, we still have this kind of job. Okay, in the automobile industry, because also it is cheaper, actually about 50% of the manpower is using robots. So you have quite a lot of robots in the making of cars today already. So if we look this, you see that robots 
is something that everybody speaks about today. It's a very hot topic. If you look at this journal's magazine, you can see that the time is speaking of a robot revolution. The German journal, the Spiegel, shows an image where a robot takes the job of someone. The same with the journal Electronics. Are robots replacing humans? In the French Humanité Journal, they say, should we be afraid of robots? And you know, Newsweek say there is a new economy of robots. And here, The Economist, a British journal, show the rise of the robots. So you see, it's a very, very important to topic in our society. But, and now I come to the core of the topic, what is a robot? So the definition, if you look Wikipedia, is a robot is a machine, specially programmable. So when I say programmable, it means it has programs, software, and it is capable of carrying a specific series of action in an autonomous way. So you see, it's not just humanoid robot. It can be any objects. So when we speak of internet of things, you could have all the objects linked together and they have this capacity of do, doing things. So examples of today's robot, I have shown you the biggest example is 50% of the manpower to do cars are robots. But other example, very concretely today, where are they? They are functional robots, is what we see. You see, for example, for the Mars exploration, you have a machine, autonomous, that can do some specific action. The same for a cleaner, and in the surgery, more and more with Da Vinci equipment, some very precise surgery are done with robots. And the same for deep underwater, uh, we can have robots, and some robots are able to detect people when there is an earthquake. Here you see the drones. More and more we will have drones everywhere. And the self-driving car is here we see the Google car, which is well known. You know, in Singapore, they pretend, as they like to be always number one, they pretend that in 2020, they will have only self-driving cars. So you see the future, but here it's already ongoing. So these are the robots which we find in many places, and it's in full development. Okay, what I would like to show you is maybe two examples of the research of the robot. You have to see uh, the ones who are very well known, maybe you have already seen this robot, I don't know. But anyway, this one is very well known, is Honda. They have produced a very well-known robot, always improving, and this robot is about uh, 130 centimeter, uh, weighs 50 kilos, and of course he has a battery, because the problem with robots is the battery. They cannot uh, walk too long because of battery. So I just would like to show you this example of this kind of robot.
I have another example to show you. This is the most advanced functional robots. It's from the Boston Robotics. It was bought by Google because Google, Apple, all these companies try to develop robots. But let's say the company initial is Boston uh, Dynamics and they have been working since 30 years about making a robot uh, very, uh, you know, uh, capable of walking and lifting a weight. So I show you, it's a very uh, well-known example of robot. So this robot is very heavy, 150 kilos, and he's 1 meter 80. So it's a very advanced robot because he's able to go on snow autonomously, so he's not directed by anybody. He's self-capable. Okay, I will stop this and go further. So, normally the public and many people have a vision of robots which comes from films. But, in some ways, fantastic to see how producers have done films and you can dream. But we have to pay, of course, very much attention because all the films which have been produced, they use real actors. In the reality, it has nothing to do with robots. It's just imaginations. So the public very often identifies their fears or the word of robots due to the films they have seen. And you know, it has started very early. If you look for older generation, uh, really older, I mean, maybe not more here, it started in 1927 with a film Metropolis, and in fact, it was someone who lost his wife and decided to create a robot similar to the wife. So you see, early 20th century, already they show, of course, it's no robots, it's just somebody who was uh, changed into the size of a robot. And if you continue, some of you have seen Blade Runners, you know, in 82. So these films show that some people were genetically engineering and they were running around Los Angeles and we couldn't distinguish them from real humans. So again, there are actors behind, but the imagination of people goes with this kind of film. The same with Terminator. Terminator has an enormous impact because in the imagination of the filmmaker, they show a robot who was a killer robot. So of course, from that on, people are very often afraid of robots, but we have to think that always behind is a real person. So if you look more recently, we have Matrix. Several people have surely seen Matrix and is the more recent. Uh, and in this one is terrible because the humans, the real ones are used as electricity or pipes or batteries for giant robots. So you see, and they are kept in a virtual reality simulacrum. So you see all this fantasy about the robots, for example, was shown in Matrix. And another more positive film, which is a 3D character. So it's through graphics. They have made all kind of shape, more object shape. And they were able to show that this different kind of robots could save the planet. So that was very positive, done by Walt Disney. 
And more recently, I was asked by journalists what I was thinking about this series, uh, which is uh, Westward. It is a series that was taken from an original film in 1973. And in this series, you have beautiful robots. In reality, they are actors which were, of course, uh, makeup like a robot. And you come in a fictional, a very big park, and you can address yourself to these robots and, of course, do whatever. You can kill, you can rape, is a free uh, word. So with this kind of fantasy word, people are very afraid of robots. And the reality is what I would like to show today also in my talk is different because in a robot, you write programs and you can control the programs you write. It's not random. So the reality is different. Okay, I will come now to social robots because what we have seen so far were functional robots. So what is the difference? I will first tell you why it is important to have social robots. So if we look at societal problems we have, I have spoken before on the manpower that we use as slavery, even children today, and the benefit that some of them do upon this slavery today. Now what I would like to show you is this curve. It's easy to understand. You see, 150 uh, years ago, or a bit more, 60 years ago, if you see, you have 5% of people age 65, and you have 15% of children sh uh, younger than five years old. So you have many more children than elderly. Now, we look in 2017, where we are, the curves are crossing. What does it mean? We are at the stage where we are going to have more elderly than children born or children less than five years old. So if you look how it will go in the next years, it is that we will reach the point where we will have 15% of elderly in our society, world society, you know this is a world global population, and the children will drop to the point where it is like today, the, you know, you, you see like in the 50s, but that time, this is the children, they will drop to something like 7%. So this is a very important societal problem, you know, and what is said is the, with most of the increase in developing countries. So this one will be the one where they will have a drop in natality and a very high amount of people who will be elderly. So the question is, who will pay to maintain these elderly? What can we do? There will be always less people who are born and always more elderly. And what do we do with these elderly? Another diagram I like to show you before I show you the social robots, because people are very often asking me, why you do social robots? I just try to show you one of the major reasons. Here you see, you have the growth of numbers of people who have dementia. Yesterday we have Professor Aaron who told us also that when you get age, now we become older, more longer older, then that's a price to pay. And this is completely true if you see that. The more you get older, the more you will get, for example, Alzheimer or dementia. And if you look at this, uh, you know, in 2017 where we are, uh, you see that we have a bit less than 20% of dementia for people who are more than a certain age. And then if you look, uh, if it goes on for high income countries, it's growing. But where it's growing, incredibly is in low and middle income countries. If you look at this, already now we have many more people with dementia and it will grow in an exponential way. So again, if you have dementia, you need 24 hours someone around you, otherwise you cannot survive. So this is something 
that explain how it is uh, important that we will have so many millions of people with dementia who will take care. So that's the reason why one solution is to have social robots. So what is a social robot? So a social robot is again an autonomous robot who is able to interact and communicate with humans in an autonomous way and following the social rules and behaviors attached to its function or to the role. So that means that a social robot is really dedicated to be with different kind of situation, human situation, and interact in a proper way. So this is completely a new area of research in robotics. It means that we have to work with sociologists, psychologists, medical people who should indicate how we interact and how we should interact, particularly with elderly. So there is an image of an elderly, which is a standard image. You have somebody here, you cannot pay all the time, somebody or family is busy. So you see, feeling lonely, most of the time nobody needs help. And as I have shown you before, the situation will worsen. So then, some people have thought about it, and one of the first who have tried to find some solution, you know, very early because his first model was 22, 20, 2002, he tried to make this kind of pet. We find it in many a senior home. And this pet is able to move the tail to respond to some sounds and learn a name and showing some emotion. And it was shown that in some senior home, at least, people were happy to have this kind of companion. So these are the first one that was done. Now, here in Japan, because Japan is maybe number one country for the developing of robots, here in Japan you see that you have some robots that can lift a person. You have seen this before in Boston Dynamics, and here the robot is able to lift a patient, so to help the nurses. Here, another example in Germany, they have put this kind of robot, is a social robot in its function, but not the appearance. And at least this robot can help to serve drinks or to monitor uh, what is around if somebody feels bad and so on. So uh, this is example which are really today functioning. And I come to Nadine robot. So our social robot we have developed in Singapore is a robot which is social, that means she can interact with people, she can understand emotion, she has a memory, and she will react in an appropriate way. So this was very new on the planet to know the existence of this kind of robot. Nadine is uh, uh, 35 kilos, and you see below, at the interior of Nadine, she's truly a robot. Afterwards, for the head, we have put a skin, and the skin needs to work with the motor. And if you see here, Nadine, uh, she cannot walk for now. Uh, she, she has no articulation in the hand. But you see, Nadine is with air motor. Why? You see, she is linked with a compressor that brings air to her, you know, supply air valve. It brings air to her cable because this robot doesn't do noise. The problem of the other robots I have shown you, they all make noise, because it's like the motor makes noise. With these air motors, Nadine interacts in a way that myself, if I move my arms, I don't do noise. So this is why we chose a robot with air. So this is Nadine and how she stands. And I would just like to say that how difficult or how, how easy to have a social robot, what are the challenges, why we should work so long. In fact, a social robot should be aware 
of the other's behavior. For example, if Nadine would be there, there, she should be aware, she is not, but she should be in the future aware that you are listening to me, I'm speaking, we are in a room, we are in Anto Fogasta. Of course, today no robot is so much aware. It's a research to be done. And the research is to be able to interpret the behavior. For example, you are bad tempered, you are uh, happy, you are very social. The robot should know, understand what is the meaning of your gestures, your smiles, your behavior. And also taking a decision. Once the robot receives quite a lot of data from what it captures about someone, the robot has to take a decision in order it reacts in an appropriate way. For example, if I'm sad, I tell Nadine, bad news today, I have this. Nadine should reply with empathy. She should be, I'm so sorry for you, and so on. So understand through the languages, the gesture, the emotion, that she has to behave this way on her own, because Nadine is completely an autonomous robot. Now, for those who do a bit of computer science, I just show you a bit of the software platform. So in fact, we capture a lot of information uh, from the world with a camera, and we capture the face, who is who, the emotions, also the gestures, if I move my gesture, if I do this, and the understanding of the situation, and also the speech, what I say Nadine can understand. And she has in her software a decision process where she has a model of emotion, so when she receives emotion, as I said, she relies to a database with millions of emotion, and she can pick up from an annotated database when she receives a new expression, which one is the correct one, and so she can detect. And also memory, she has a memory, so when you see Nadine a second or third time, she will anyway tell you, I have seen you on that day, you were happy, you told me this. So you understand the memory for human is extremely important. And when you see the action, she has to model the reaction. That means she has to get an appropriate reaction. So just for the memory, what is very important, before the 70s, it was impossible to define a memory because no, no psychologist could define it. Thanks to Turing, we know that a short time memory allows to uh, give information about who is the person, what does she say, when does she meet, where are the things, and so on. So this is what we keep in a memory. And very later on, maybe some of you have seen it, there was a quite a nice film, again, about somebody who every five minutes lost his memory and the effect of that. So a filmmaker understood the role of short-term memory and made a film which was very, uh, very successful. Okay, what I would just like to show you is some demos how we work with my students. So for example, when I tell you uh, Nadine is able to recognize a face, how does she do it? And many people ask me this question. So you have to know in our lab in Singapore, we work as well with a virtual character or Nadine. Nadine is also in virtual stage. So it's the same platform. Either we use virtual character or Nadine because the, platform, the software is the same. So here you see how Nadine recognizes or the virtual character is because in fact, she divides the, the face into small uh, pixels. So like a screen is divided into pixels. And then afterwards, with the difference of colors and uh, thickness or height, she can identify what is the mouse, how is the shape of the face, and so on. It's like the digital printing for the fingers is the same. So Nadine distinguish that, and from a huge database, again, that she has in uh, AI or deep learning algorithm, 
once she extracts from someone she's looking, either she has it already or she creates a new item in the database for this person. So I just show you an example with a virtual human of that. So just an example of a student working so you can see how we work. Those who would like, I see so many young people, so you, if you have to come, you can work in this. First time seeing you today. Hello. Sorry, I do not know you. Please introduce yourself to me by going to the laptop and entering your name. Okay. Please come back and stand inside the square and face the webcam. Okay. We now start the registration. Please keep the current position for 30 seconds. Registration complete. It's the first time you need to be introduced to a virtual human, or Nadine. Hello, we am Faye. Seeing you again. Hello. Welcome back. Hello, Sophie. Hello, chats. First time seeing you today. Okay, this is an example. Another one I will skip, but just explain to you is you have Nadine and a virtual human, and you can show different gesture and they recognize also due to all kind of methods I have explained to you uh, with database of millions of gestures and when you do one, then the computer is looking to which one it corresponds and know uh, thanks to that uh, which is the gesture. So this is some example. Here we have been working on falling, you know, very often age people are falling. So how do we detect how a robot or virtual human detects how somebody is falling? So one of my PhD students was working on that. And in fact, uh, there was a virtual human, or Nadine is the same. I can show you the, just this experience here. That here. Wow. Here. It's a camera tracking, and in fact, the camera detects the skeleton and the position of the skeleton. You got that. If you're okay, please stand up. You fell down. If you are okay, please stand up. You did not stand up. I am calling for help now. Ambulance is on the way. So you see if you have a robot or such. Ambulance is on the way. Virtual characters, so these uh, people can detect and inform because they are computers, so they can inform uh, relatives that something is happening. So another thing I would like to show you is the emotion of Nadine. If we speak to her badly, she will become mad, bad politely, but you know, she has also her reaction because she has a model of personality and emotions based on the psychology. So here you will see uh, one of my PhD students who is working with Nadine and interacting, and he's not necessarily always kind. You will see. Hi, Nadine. Hi, nice to meet you. Let's talk about today's time. OK. So they What's like to the beach. Uh, go shopping. You look pretty today. Oh, thank you. You are so nice. So nice you are. You are so nice. Yeah. You're really kind. I really like you. Shall we go swimming? I'd like to go swimming with you. But you look ugly today. Do not say so. We look good friends. Your words are sticky. Do not fool me. You are so boring. Oh. 
Sorry. I don't have to talk with you. Hmm. I'm sorry, Donut. I hope you can change your mind. You are so mean. What is wrong with you today? I don't have to go with you. No, let's stop. Shall we go swimming? Something without you. Goodbye. You do not have to come back. So you see that the interaction could be quite natural. One thing we never speak about robots is they have to detect the noises, the sounds, and there's some research being done also to detect the sounds. So I just show you, uh, is a lot of research and Hello, these people spend... Speech. How are you today? Yeah, fine. Um, I got this in the mail for you. Speech. Okay, thank you. And cause of sound. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. Speech. See you. Bye -bye. Speech. Now then, call the sound. Yeah, hello? Uh, yeah. Do you want me Speech. to come? Okay, I'll come in now. Speech. At least in this example, what you can see or hear is that not only we need to recognize visuals, but the robots or virtual human has to recognize the sounds around. And this was an example. Now I show you some final example, uh, one is, uh, you know, when the journalist uh, know, uh, saw Nadine for the first time, it went all over the planet because it was quite new. Uh, there was the traditional robotics, but not autonomous social robots that could behave differently according to different individuals and remember. So I just show you uh, this, an example, and afterwards, I have a last example to show you. is linked to uh, Wikipedia or any uh, Google, whatever, so we get the answer. This is a natural interaction. She is a humanoid robot. As we can see, very realistic. She looks a bit like my daughter. Yes, is it the case? And um, she was done in Japan, but she can explain herself. She has very natural skin, also beautiful hair. And she has similar hands like mine, uh, and she can, she has 27 degrees of freedom, 
and she can move her arms up the body and she can look, smile, talk, recognize people and uh, recognize colors and some gestures. Maybe Nadine, we could do some, some uh, Nadine, hello, so <laughs> we can do some photos. Are we doing uh, some photos, Nadine, yeah? Let's make a selfie of both of us, yeah? Can we do? Yeah, okay, so, yeah. Hello, my name is Nadine. I am your companion of the future. Okay, so just uh, to show you what we're doing now and in the future, Nadine has no articulated hands and, you know, Nadine costs a quarter of millions of US dollars and we are building a new Nadine who is 3D printing. We model in 3D and then we print automatically. So we hope in the next year to produce a Nadine for 10,000 uh, Singapore or US dollars. And Nadine now will move to a very famous museum for six months in Singapore. So she will meet a lot of people. So you see, here we are trying to make the articulation of the hand. In the hand, we have 50%, half of our articulation of the whole body is in the hand. So it is really a big challenge. So here I show you how we work presently. Because the good point, if she has hands, she can grasp things, she can play, she can do a lot of things because we human use a lot our hands. So here I show you the example of the hands, if I can. Yes. Oh, well, it's a bit complicated, sorry. <laughs> just some images where she will do in the future because if she has the hands you know and recognizing people and having empathy you can see she can discuss with this lady or feed people who cannot do by themselves so there are images that will be next some task a robot Nadine could do so this is quite important with the statistic I have given to you previously and the last thing is just to show a very happy note, Nadine can also entertain people. So we were in a party and they say we would like to have uh, some Nadine singing. So we have streamed Nadine, she is in Singapore in our lab, and she was streamed to the cafe where finally uh, she has uh, sing a song. So you will see this one here. <laughs>
congratulations. So thank you very much.